pentagram dedicated to Henry Foreman. In the years of the primal from the dawn of terrestrial birth, man mastered the mammoth and horse, and man was the lord of the earth. He made him an hollow skin from the heart of a holy tree. He compassed the earth therein, and man was the lord of the sea. He controlled the vigorous steam, he harnessed the lightning for hire, he drove the celestial team, and man was the lord of the fire. Deep mouth. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good whatever, good whomever, good however I may find you, animal, vegetable, mineral, whatever you may identify as. This is Alan Averill, this is Agitators Anonymous, this is episode 50-something or other, who may know where it will fit into the canon of Agitators Anonymous, because I'm pushing the boat out a little bit with this podcast. Um, I've done slightly more in-depth podcasts before. I did one on Alistair Crowdy and one on Anton LaVey. And maybe I um, derelicted some of my duties in that regard as I began to just ramble and talk about culture, history, politics, and I suppose become a little bit obsessed with the terms of lockdown, the terms of the situation that we're in, and tried to do address that. And so some of the other podcasts that I had prepared, whether they were on the Knights Templar or Alan Turing or this kind of thing, were neglected. So there's been a bit of study gone into this one. Um, and so let's try, or at least I'm going to try and um, put into words some of my thoughts about Friedrich Nietzsche. I think that if we're going to be trite about it, um, Nietzsche at a certain moment in the early to mid 90s became totally in vogue with the black metal, um, I suppose, the black metal scene. Very often you saw quotes from Nietzsche, the whole God is dead concept, the sort of anti-Christian element or on the surface anti-Christian element of Nietzsche's writing began to permeate through the metal scene. Lots and lots of quotes. Um, you know, I'm sure there's a black metal album somewhere called Nietzscheism, that kind of thing. And so like most people at the time, um, as a sort of teenager who was interested in these kind of things, uh, I picked up the pocket Nietzsche, which isn't pocketed or pocket-sized at all. In fact, it's rather uh, huge, to say the least. Um, and, of course, found it difficult to penetrate, hard to read, as it is, and punctuated with incredibly um, illuminating moments. But lately, during the terms of um, the last... As spring now... Uh, you know, as we have arrived in spring, in lockdown, and let's be honest, it looks like a form of summer within the same um, situation. I began to really look at people like uh, Rousseau, Hobbes, um, Tocqueville, various uh, philosophers in the last few weeks, maybe month, going back over things I tried to read as a, I suppose, as an 18 or 19 year old, as a 20 year old. Um, and try and make sense of the concepts of liberty, of democracy, of freedom, of some of the words that I've been using over the last while and where their origins came from. Um, Scepticism, cynicism, the Socratic method, Aristotle, um, things like this, um, Woolen's craft, whatever. Um, trying to understand how pre people previous to us understood some of the terms that I've just been vomiting forth or blah, blah, blahing in my podcast. And have I been getting them right? Of course, the podcast is my opinion about these things. So on those terms, it is what it is. But what else could I um, understand about those definitions? And I think Nietzsche is commonly misunderstood. Um, I think that people who don't really understand what he was trying to write about, think that he gave uh, free reign to lots of the worst impulses, for example, of fascism in the 20th century, that kind of thing. I think a lot of that can be laid at the blame, uh, a lot of blame for that can be laid at the feet of his sister, um, who certainly was a bit of a C word, we may say, in uh, if we're going to be um, heavy metal flippant about it. Um, Although that's a that's a an ancient word, isn't it? That it's you can that's a medieval word, pre-medieval. Anyway, whatever. 
And I think a lot of his, um, I suppose, turn of the century followers um, may have amplified the reason why he resonated as that sort of house philosopher of fascism. But I don't I think it's an unfair uh, critique. I think it's something that's leveled against him by people who don't really understand him. I can't claim to completely understand him. But, you know, he's a what should we call him? A heavy metal hero. Let's start that up again. Um, let's have a little bit of a look and I'll try and wade my way through my understanding of some of the things and try and get bogged down or not get bogged down as the case may be. But remember, I ain't no philosopher. Um, I'm just a singer in a heavy metal band. So, Mr. Nietzsche, hot for Nietzsche, huh? Let's have a look at your life. But first, let's do a small ad read. I say this every week. Hate Couture, H-A-T-E-C-O-U-T-U-R-E 616.com. Um, lots of, uh, in fact, you can go there and buy a T-shirt with Nietzsche on it, if you wish. Um, you know, you could walk around with a, emblematic symbols of venerated tyrants and serial killers yes exactly go there use the promo code a l a n and you will get free shipping okay friedrich what's up what's up let's have a look at this so the two most um i suppose there are several phrases that nietzsche used um i mean um i'm not going to go into all oh, the whole wikipedia of where he was born when exactly he lived i mean um, we're looking at the middle, uh, you know, this is 19th century. He wrote most of his works. I mean, he was gushing forth so much stuff in the 1870s. And by the 1880s, he'd kind of gone mad and um, driven mad by syphilis, I would imagine, because um, he contracted that in his 20s while um, studying in Leipzig, I think, with some various ladies of the night. Um, and back then there was no uh, penicillin. Penicillin wasn't developed, I think, until 1924. So living with syphilis was a rather painful uh, existence, which I think Marx, who I'm also going to do something a little bit about, um, who I think has been terribly misunderstood in the modern age as well, um, if I can say so. Anyway, our boy Friedrich lived with um, a permanent pain throughout his life caused by syphilis. So I'm not going to go into the Wikipedia of when he was born and where he did this and when he went to Basel and Switzerland. But needless to say, he was um, something of a loner of a child, a small child. He was an ill child. Um, and I think that he had an awful lot of time to sit and think or lie in bed and think on his own. Um, and he reminds me in a way of Lovecraft, I suppose, like this, very such an outsider, such a loner in his own society. And I think some of the crazy ideas, because surely when you read Nietzsche, it's driven through with a certain craziness, is from almost like a fever dream intensity um, based on sickly, sickly children. He was... Um, he was one of the earliest philosophers in a very complicated, structured um, German schooling system. He suffered from myopia. He had bad eyesight. You've probably seen these haunting images of him with his big bushy mustache and quite honestly, um, super intense, ghostly um, look on his face. Um, his father died young. His brother died at two years old. Um, let's just call him a serious, a serious young man. Um, he became friends with Richard Wagner and subsequently fell out with him. Uh, he seemed to fall out with almost everyone that he met at some stage or other. Um, he was a difficult man, a very difficult man. What did he mean by the Ubermensch? And how is it, as I said, that, you know, at the beginning of this, he became so misunderstood and misinterpreted? Um, many of his many of his works at the time were not read. They were not read um, widely. He was just gushing forth so much stuff, writing so much stuff in the 1970s that I think he almost never took a stop to to to, to break. Um, and society never really caught up with the amount that he was writing back and forth. He referenced himself all the time through various, um, you know, one chapter of one book would reference something he's written in another book he would go off on mad tangents a lot of his books weren't translated until the 1890s and so there's you know that 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 he would come and go in um terms of favoritism he found a kind of rebirth in the 1960s and the 70s which was far enough away from the second world war and the people who had eulogized him during the second world war to gain a sort of resurgence 
Um, he's curiously, oh, well, I suppose it makes sense. He's linked to, I suppose, the elements of critical theory in the 1960s and 70s, because certainly uh, Nietzsche's idea that we should convention all or we should question all of our conventional understandings about good and evil, um, how good versus bad turned into good versus evil, the sense of uh, bad becoming a, an element of morality and the idea of questioning all of your morality was it inherited was there a family tree of morality and was there a state before that morality existed where we were I suppose what Nietzsche would have called the um, the ubermensch or whatever you want to call it the ascendant human the um, pure human something like this you know dangerous rhetoric I suppose in the wrong hands but this was not what Nietzsche meant or intended um, you know, you don't blame the country and western singer for the guy who goes off with a shotgun and kills his wife because he listened to Hank Williams in 1923 or whatever. What am I talking about? Yeah. Anyway, you understand what I mean. Um, he'd spent the last 10 years of his life in a madhouse, most definitely in a madhouse, um, just writing crazy letters. Um, he really was driven mad. And I think that that is a common, at least as I understand, a common consequence of a lifetime living with syphilis. He had um, seems to have had relations with women in his 20s, um, a curious sexual relationship with women, um, had a sort of unrequited love triangle with a woman called Salome, who was in her 20s, um, a sort of celibate love triangle. Uh, and this woman, I think, eventually went off, uh, went off gallivanting with the one Sigmund Freud. Um, but his, his life, you know, you do wonder with some of these lads, if someone had just given them the odd jump, the odd jump of the bones, they might have relaxed a little bit. Sorry, sorry, Friedrich, for discussing your um, airing your dirty linen in public. But uh, this is the nature of things 130 or 40 years later. So most of what heavy metal sees in, I suppose, Friedrich Nietzsche was will to power. God is dead, that kind of thing. And there's very, he has very many, um, I suppose, T-shirt slogans that one would have seen back in the day. Um, so what I'm going to try in my own demented way is to try and just move through some of the ideas that Nietzsche had, how maybe we've misunderstood them, or at least I've understood and misunderstood them. You're going to hear the turn in the pages because I'm not speaking off the top of my head exactly here. I am, but what I tend to do is write a sort of um, crazy tree of words. That's how I used to study. I would write words and these would associate and hopefully flicker into life my synapses to um, waffle on whatever the subject was. So the will to power in God is dead. The idea that um, God is dead is um, the cause of this will to power because Nietzsche considered the idea that um, the will to power of the powerless, i.e. that people would rather will into being their powerlessness than um, be nothing, be in nothingness. So that, that essentially, that will to power that he embodies or that um, normal people will construct essentially meant that God was dead which I think is a sort of misunderstanding um, in a way, because they're just slogans. So to put it in the context, um, Nietzsche didn't really like science. He didn't like Darwin. After Darwin, many, many people in, I suppose, society across Europe, across the world, read him and began to wonder if the constructs of their society that uh, were incorrect, that we shouldn't take the Bible as an instrument of truth, of history. Um, Nietzsche, oddly enough, didn't, like I said, didn't seem to take to science. He thought it was, again, another construct. And all the time he seems to be, I suppose, trying to echo back to this um, pre-structural state. Um, the idea that the, the, the powerful image of man, um, this powerful pre-structural state of animism, of, of, uh, is what m the ubermensch or the small percentage should aspire to. Um, so let's try and if wade my way through some of this stuff that I have. Um, I mean, if you consider, you know, say the Christian morality of the meek shall inherit the earth um, as a sentence. Well, then who who would have written that but the meek themselves? And I think within Nietzsche is the idea that um, the majority of people hold down 
the minority. The minority are these people who live on instinct, these um, people who are not bound by the conventions of structures of structures of modern morality, but yet that they are held in place by the almost as Tocqueville would have said, the tyranny of the majority. Um, and that's a very interesting and I suppose um, dangerous idea for its time. It still kind of is because um, because Nietzsche is questioning um, where do we get our morality from? Um, is it inherited? Why do we um, adhere to these structures? And that we should have instincts. Our original instincts were beyond good and evil. Um, and that this early simple story fascinates Nietzsche. But it comes with, um, we become infected almost with a complex inherited morality. I think you could almost call it like he considers that we we at one stage in our preternatural state had a sort of animal clarity, a kind of total independence, a less self-conscious version of ourselves. And I suppose a pre-moral state to the moral. Um, and so he questions society constantly. Why did good versus bad? And if you think about this, once upon a time we had good and bad, but then bad became evil. And why is that? Is that the product of morality? He viewed Christianity um, as having propagated an epidemic of pity, I think. And Nietzsche really despised, I think, uh, pity. Um, almost he felt that the, let's call them the, the minority of people, these sort of instinctual ubermensches, um, should have disdain for the weak. Um, that the many should not rule That the weak should not rule the strong, um, that the that those who are healthy should not care for those who are sick or indigent. Again, sort of slightly dangerous ideals, but I think what Nietzsche is trying to do is to trying to almost break down this mold, break down the structure as to why we adhere to these views of morality, um, and question um, how did the many come to dominate the few. Um, who, why do we accept moral rule over the older version of ourselves, which Nietzsche seems to, I suppose, romantically idealize? I mean, I'm sure he would not view the idea of the romantic view of that as, a, as, the, as the proper sentence or the proper observation. But I suppose in heavy metal terms, what Nietzsche um, idolizes is the actual, the genuine lone wolf who is independent of the inherited structures of thought. Um, you may know, of course, the quote, the will to power, the will to power. What does that mean? As I understood it, the will to power is the will to create something rather than be nothing. Um, hierarchy is uh, not constitutional or political. Power is innate. Um, what is good and by whose measure is that? How do we define society's morality? He seems to very much believe that, you know, acta non verba, actions, not words. Um, true creatives, true creative people, they just do it. They just follow their instincts. And of course, this can, um, th you know, it's so brain breaking because what he also identifies, I suppose, in a way is um, how disdain became disgust. We moved into these sort of moral structures of how we viewed our distance from other people. Um, he doesn't think the ideas of community, I think, really uh, mean anything doesn't re even view the modern structures of civilization i suppose in a in a positive way he sees them as grids and structures that constrain us constantly from this old um i suppose the lone wolf state it's quite complicated and it's broken my brain trying to really get back into reading it again and i'm not really even sure i exactly understand the um the paradox in which he sort of is super objective, super objects to Christianity um, on the one hand, because he observes and very uses very often. And it, what's really strange is his writing will go off into explaining in in depth, um, in in depth passages, torture method, methods used by medieval Christians in Germany, for example. Um, very in depth. Who are the people who boiled others alive? They were Christians. But yet, the, but yet Christianity is a structure of projection by the weak because the weak would rather will this nothingness into being than be nothing, which is a sense, in a sense, is the, contra is, the, is the will to power. I don't know whether I can call it the contradiction of the will to power, but the power of creating 
um, a structure from nothing gives the powerless some form of structure. Now that kind of breaks my brain trying to consider um, how do the weak express, themse express themselves? Weakness is some sort of like an, an ethic. As I said, the, the meek shall inherit the earth. So he observes the horrors of Christianity. And I think what mi he's misunderstood is that um, he, through his own identification of it, when he predicts that God is dead, he, he sees this as a liberating thing. That now that we've understood the horrors of Christianity and that God it's himself um, or whoever he may be, that God is dead. We can, we're can, we free to sail out to sea to find this other um, pre-structural truth within ourselves. But yet what I find complicated is, is, is the concept that um, the will to power itself is also uh, an implement wielded by the weak to rule over the minority. But yet that will to power is also exemplified in that um, unrestrained, unfettered, um, just simple movement through life that the true, I suppose, the creatives, the lone wolves had. Maybe it's Nietzsche admired people like that. Maybe he wanted to be one to be like that because his own physical cage that he was in, his own cage of flesh and blood was a weak one. So maybe this some part of his fever dream is... Um, his willing, his willingness to or want to ascend to that place. Um, I, I don't know. It's very difficult to say. I will say that very often when you read things like this, you have to put them in the context of the time. Um, along with this, I've been rereading the Communist Manifesto and Marx and Engels and stuff and a few other things. And you have to put them in the context of 1849 or 1850 or 1870, 72 or whatever. Um, applying modern morals to writings from 150, 200 years ago, not taking into account the context with which they were written is a fool's errand. Uh, it really is a fool's errand. And I think is perfectly um, part of modern society's inability, uh, my observation, to understand or allow nuance into the argument. We can pull down statues from people three, 400 years ago, but what a world that existed three, 400 years ago. And what a world will exist two or three hundred years from now when people will probably do the same to people who consider themselves virtues of morality now. What, I'm what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that um, Nietzsche became so misunderstood. Like I said, he almost became the house, the house philosopher of fascism. And that was mainly, that was not, of course, anything to do with him or his writing it was elements of the people who supported him elements like I said of his sister this kind of thing but um, he in that sense was not his brother's keeper I think you know he's misunderstood on those terms um, it reminds me sometimes his sort of liberated view on all of the senses and this lone wolf ideal almost of Epicureanism um, I don't know if I've connected two things that don't that I maybe are from well Epicureanism in the sense that um Nietzsche doesn't like the Stoics. He views them, he, you know, he viewed them, he views them as non-alive. Too many questions. Socra Socrates has too many questions. Um, live, not question. Asking for permission stifles action. Good and bad actions become good and evil. He he admires the doing man, acta non verba. Um, but when you try and read through it, um, it's got some incredible sprawling tone to the narrative that will without a doubt break your brain and there are passages that are I suppose genuinely sort of shocking his almost uh, uh, seeming admiration for cruelty for disdain his um, seemingly genuine hatred of communality of um, elements of friendship I suppose love thy neighbor things that I suppose have descended into common um sort of parlance of morality that he just despises. Now, how much of this, I suppose, is the the writings of just, as I said, an angry man? And because it's so uh, violent and aggressive sometimes in it, in, in its narrative. Um, but he, yeah, yes, in a sense that he wants people to embrace, I think, this old um, animalistic Maybe animalistic is not the right word, but this old pre-structural state. So therefore, as I said, the Stoics, who I've been reading a lot of, Nietzsche disliked them. 
So maybe that's why I see a form of what he's talking about in the Epicurean ideal of um, indulgence of those, um, indulgence of that, of the pleasures of the animal state. Um, second guessing oneself is a sign of submission to the structure, to the structure of Christianity. Um, and so you kind of get into this idea that where you have um, the, the post um, addendum or whatever you want to call it, or and that's not the right word, but the, the priestly philosophy um, then leads us to what Nietzsche dislikes is like, oh, it's almost like the ownership of property. The idea that this is mine, that is yours, which leads to debt, which leads to um, all of these sort of elements of society that are structurally designed on some level to oppress these instincts. It's quite complicated and I can't say I've completely understood it um, because a lot of the times he's referencing um, medieval structures within society and the origins of that story, which seem even further away now, 150 years later. But um, property, like, uh, again, this is mine, creates obligation, creates debts. You owe one thing to another person, creates ownership. Um, and so therefore, all goes into the structure of stifling um, the independent state. Um, I mean, does this mean Nietzsche is, um, does it mean that he's, um, you know, adhering to adhering to anarchy? It, it certainly sounds like it sometimes. I know anarchy is a kind of buzzword right now in in modern times. And um, I'll get into that again when I discuss Marx and stuff. Um, and I'm understanding more and more about the idea of anarchy, especially I would say this. And I said this in an interview um, or one of the podcasts I was doing in that people on the let's call them the anarcho left that I would have found more opposition with a few years ago. Now, um, I, you know, there's some ideals that they're, that are becoming more and more clear to me in light of the strange situation we are right now in dealing with, you know, you you look at the, um, listen to the words of the uh, WEF, the World Economic Forum, and Eric Schmidt and all these people, and the, it, the idea that um, anarchy itself can maybe be an answer to that one percent rule i don't know it's complicated i haven't got my head fully around it yet but i don't know if nietzsche is advocating for anarchy um but certainly he views property um somehow that it ends in an idea of shame guilt morality owing money having debts um being tied to a structure i'm not sure what he recommends as the alternative to that um and also, I think he's conflicted about being against the Stoics because the Stoics are pre-Christian. Um, but because he views the Christian structure as the structure for the weak to rule. Um, Nietzsche calls it the slave revolt, which, of course, has um, implications for using that word now. But like I said, trying to view or read um, philosophers from 150, 60 years ago or more in terms of modern um, knee-jerk morality doesn't make any sense these are his words this the slave revolt of morality is 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 what christianity essentially is um your debt to the i, I would call it like your debt to the grid of god is fed by christianity good and evil these laws these codes um and like i said his his feelings about cruelty um he believes that even though all religions are founded in cruelty um yet he seems to be I, i'm not sure sitting on the fence really about if it's used in the in the in the um the will or the agency of the will to power like i said he goes through all these torture methods this kind of thing well let me take a breath because it's it is brain breaking trying to get back into this. Um, I, I would say that um, trying to get back into study during these times is a good thing. It's given me a sort of a little bit of inner peace and calm to go back and read and especially to identify throughout history 
where other um, writers and authors, other I say, um, people have lived through, of course, way worse things than we're living through. But let's consider this a pivotal moment in human history that we haven't, it hasn't quite been revealed to us yet what it is. Um, these have happened throughout history. And that's one of the things I've been trying to sort of say to people, to friends, to anyone who listen. And I get it, they're kind of sick of hearing it. But when you boil it down to, um, do you believe what's happening or is all you're told? If not, if yes, well, nothing is an absolute. Nothing is 100%, at least in my opinion. There are always counter narratives, side narratives, many, many different things happening at once. So if you submit to the fact that there are other narratives, then what are the other narratives? That's always what I'm trying to get at. What is, I don't know, if we can't agree on what the meta narrative is, is or even the understanding that dozens of things are happening at the same time. Um, that's what I've been trying to get at when trying to understand the situation that we're in. So reading back through some of these philosophers, and I'm going to try and in my own um, heavy metal singing way, uh, look at some of these people, because some of these ideas that we have about society are nothing new. Um, like Hobbes, as I said, or Tocqueville, or these kind of things. Anyway, what am I talking about? Yeah, another ad read, metalblade.com. If you're in North America, you can get 10% off by mentioning the um, promo code AA podcast. Come on, look, 10% off the new Cannibal Corpse. Um, buy some old primordial stuff, Dread Sovereign, etc., etc. Too many bands to mention. You don't own Hello Waits on vinyl? Of course, you need that, right, don't you? All right. Of course you do. Did Nietzsche believe in democracy? Um, I don't think he did. I think he believed that, the again, the welfare state itself was something that was overlaid as part of this grid or this structure. Um, is civilization the will of the powerless? Because this is the progression of all of these grids and structures. It's, again, difficult to say. One thing is for sure... Um, I think an awful lot of his anger, of course, is reflected in his position, his place within um, society at the time. And I think that the, the, the physical pain that he was in very much, you very much, I think it's it's difficult to disassociate these writers from where they were at the time, how complicated and difficult sometimes life could be, because we are living a, a life of a certain kind of, I suppose, most of us luxury. And you forget that some of the um, some of the abject poverty or hardships that many, many people experienced when they wrote these things or sicknesses that there was no cure for. Um, the bone bending um, pain of syphilis seems to scream through in some of this angry writing. Um, and what does Nietzsche want? Um, well, that's a complicated question. What Certainly, he asks that um, the things that we thought were good or think are good were once bad, i.e. community, sharing in the pre-human state. These were signs, I suppose, of weakness. Um, it almost seems to me that he wants, he has some sort of idyllic pagan society in mind, some sort of ancient society. And I suppose this is where you begin to look at um, some of the attachments or that they the, the sort of limpet views that attach themselves to his writing of, of, of fascism in the 30s um, because they saw fascism as this other religion that was going to supplant these religious structures and you can certainly see why somebody would have read in those things into Nietzsche but as I said before that's not the fault of the man himself but he seems to be sort of aspiring to some form of ultimate independence and that I suppose is the ascendance to the uber mensch um, how can we apply it to now um, it seems he makes one very salient point well he makes many salient points but one that really hit to me which was um, we need distance from what enslaves us we need distance from the structures and the grids. Now, I know, I suppose, originally he would have thought of this as the grid of morality. But I very much read that and thought about, the, of course, social media, how it has grown to enslave us. 
our slavish devotion to its drip drip feed of likes and dislikes it's um it's we're you know we are uh, supping at the pipette the cocaine pipette like the rats in the, in the wheel the rats in the experiment who constantly need that little um little bite of adrenaline endorphin that little cocaine bump um but he nietzsche uh, he admonishes us and also, I think, um, encourages us to try and take distance from what enslaves us, um, to not be trapped within the grid of modern society, the morality of modern society. Um, I don't think he's not he's not a nihilist. I think that's a very uh, maybe that's too simplistic a view. Um, I mean, I do think that the evolutionary story on these terms provokes a kind of nihilism um, and the nihilists claim Nietzsche for their own, uh, very much like the punks claimed early speed metal for their own. But I told you it was satanic speed metal. Slayer wore eyeliner. They weren't punks. Exactly. Nietzsche would know. Nietzsche would know. Um, But what I would say is that um, the stifling of this will, of this, of this, of the state of acta non verba, um, the stifling of this will was created by the will of the powerless because they would rather express their will in this way, guilt, shame, religion, than have nothing. So they have willed um, an opposition to nothingness uh, into an element of power over the minority of people who are the actor non verba, the lone wolf, so to speak. Um, how can we say some what's a clumsy analogy? Um, stones tied to your feet. And you're drowning, sinking to the bottom, but everybody is swimming in the same water. Is that is that something I could say? I don't know. Um, this cruelty, this dis, this disgust, this sense of Christian morality or modern societal morality is um, nurtured by the will of the powerless. Um, he wasn't popular at the time, like I said. Um, he was almost forgotten in the asylum in the uh, 1880s. Most of his best writing is the in the 1870s. Um, and he certainly went mad. Um, you can he had lots of um, advocates, I suppose, in the 20th century. You could say Roosevelt, George Bernard Shaw um, wrote about him. Was he a misanthropist? I mean, you know, that's a popular word in heavy metal terms. Um I don't know. I think he was more of a misanthropist than a nihilist. Um, and I suppose he became at some stage, as I said, the German philosopher. And this idea of dominance that he um, seemed to um, advocate for was associated with German cruelty. I suppose if we go back to um, the sort of late 19th century colonialism, most people, I think that um, you're looking at the French, the British, the Russians, and maybe is it? I guess the Turkish is the big players in Europe in the 19th century. And the fact that Germany had no, um, am I right to say Turkey? I think so. Um, and the fact that Germany had no, uh, in a sense, empire in, during the era of empire building, maybe they led us to the First World War and that kind of thing. And the associated cruelty with the l late 19th century colonial exploits maybe i'm that's a stretch there but this association and therefore the association of nietzsche with those things was as i said more the fault of his sister you can look up her on your own time or his disciples people who um became uh, you know who associated him him um, tagged him on to these things and as i said he became the sort of house philosopher for many many nefarious ideas um and I suppose in the post World War Two, he was essentially cancelled, as we would have said now. Um, but like I said, in the nineteen sixties and seventies, he he sort of reappeared with critical theory. He influenced postmodernism um, because you know he was saying that all of this around us is a construct. I don't think that he was just saying that things like language or anything are a construct. Or he wasn't going into the the foolish stroke, playful stroke, um, deliberately obtuse elements of. Um, critical theory or postmodernism, but certainly the idea that we were to question the structure of morality was a very big influence on um, on postmodernism. Um, 
I suppose we would have considered Nietzsche a, a sort of toxic, angry man, you know. Toxic masculinity, my dear Friedrich. Um, I don't think you can find much politics really in it. Um, not nationalism. Um, I think those things came after him in the 20th century and locked themselves onto him. But I, I don't see much to do with politics. Most of it is about um, the human being, the human experience, the human relationship to the structures, as I said, of, of morality. They, they aren't really... They aren't really political. He's not really advocating for any politics that I particularly um, find. I think that um, you can find a sort of very simple heroism in some of his stories. I think that you can find um, there is not much humor in it. He, he doesn't seem to be much fun, old Friedrich. I certainly wouldn't have um, tagged him, you know, tagged him in your photo of a Saturday night on Facebook. I think he'd remove that tag pretty quick. Um he certainly wasn't a a fun guy. Boom, you can insert your own joke there. Um, but there is an element of the sort of aspirational heroism that I think can appeal uh, to some form of um, sense of g getting the job done, focusing, trying to question, trying to not subject oneself to codes of inherited morality. And that's at least something I think well, in my own small way, have tried to implement in being, um, it's encouraged me to be a skeptic, um, not a cynic, although I do verge into cynicism. Um, and those two words, skepticism and cynicism, have very unusual origins when you look back on them. Um, but the, the cynical, the cynics, I'm not going to start into what the difference between cynicism and scepticism is. But the idea that you do question these codes, these inherited morality, you you question the things that you're handed down. Um, and from where? From why? Who were the people who created those and what did they inherit? And are they essentially um, the this tyranny of the majority? Are they, which do you identify with? Are they suppressing your own individual acta non verba? Um, you know, maybe... The whole lone wolf, lone wolf winter ideal um, permeated heavy metal, um, heavy metal syntax for the last 20 or 30 years. But as I found over the last year, question things and um, ask questions and you will get very often responses the opposite of that. And you think to yourself, well, was was all this rebellion just window dressing? Maybe. Maybe. But I would like to read this to maybe place Nietzsche in a certain light at the end of this. The idea, the amor fati, amor fati, to love one's fate. Um, let's leave with a quote from that. I want to learn more and more to see as beautiful what is necessary in things than I shall be one of those who make things beautiful. Amor fati, let that be my love henceforth. I do not want to wage war against what is ugly. I do not want to accuse. I do not even want to accuse those who accuse. Looking away shall be my only negation. And all in all, and on the whole, someday I wish to be only a yes-sayer. Indeed, different tone there from Mr. Friedrich, the Amor Fati. To love one's fate. Well, to live one's life so fully that you would relive it over and over again. I suppose the idea of eternal recurrence, something like this. So maybe let's start doing that, my friends. Living your life in such a way that you would wish to go it over and over again. <laughs> that could be another version of hell. Well, who knows? So, I mean, it's a bit of a ramble. It's a bit of a stretch, me starting to get into discussing philosophers. Um, I, I'm not sure what exactly you might have got from that. Maybe it's encouraged you to go and have a little read pick out something did he show us the reality of our instincts um or was or was he just used by his followers for justifying horror it's difficult to say i find some of his some of his ideals liberating most definitely liberating um in the sense of uh, questioning these structures of morality um and also the idea of i suppose um is it possible for those who are uh, willing you know who are um, oppressing the minority, so to speak, 
are they is it possible for them to become amongst that minority themselves because they ascend to this other place i suppose that's the question um part of the question of nietzsche is uh, where you find yourself within that argument because certainly identifying with that pre-structural almost animalistic ideal opens itself to a lot of um, things that society right now would deem to be um, amoral, uh, cruel. Um, it would make you a very difficult person to deal with, certainly. Um, so do we take micro um, elements of that, so to speak? Do we look upon small little actions that we do and place them in that structure? It's hard to say. For me, definitely... And there were elements that make sense to adopt, i.e., it to me, Nietzsche was the stepping stone, on, one of the stepping stones onto which questioning morality, questioning the structures of power above you, questioning um, inherited wisdom just without um, any, you know, without any second guessing, so to speak. It tries to put you in this preternatural, not preternatural, this pre-structural state, which maybe you find within um, excellence in sport, in music, in creativity, in focus, in um, getting that job done of the thing that you're trying to push over the line and doing it with um, the m least amount of second guessing, I suppose, is the uh, instinctual state that Nietzsche would have admired. Anyway, I'm going to do one of these about um, the Communist Manifesto, about a few other things. Um, the idea, what does liberty mean? Because I find that I keep using the word liberty and I'm, I'm, I mean it almost in a classical sense. I'm not talking about the USA libertarian ideal. But certainly right now when we're dealing with something like a pandemic, many, many people um, are embracing a form of collectivism, i.e. that we all deal with everything in the same way deal with everyone in the same way and there's a sort of uh, I suppose a sort of fuzzy collectivist logic in what's happening now and when you speak to libertarianism or liberty people react against that and I'm not sure I fully or they fully understand exactly the context of that so I'm going to really try and dig into what does liberty mean a bit um, and also some stupid heavy metal stories don't worry don't worry I'm not gone all Crazy. Anyway, Friedrich, hot for Nietzsche. Friedrich, my dear son, I wish I'd been around to um, give you an old dose of penicillin and buy you a beer and, you know, chillax a bit, old son. Um, I'm pretty sure Nietzsche would have been into war metal, no doubt about it. Um, so go on, read some Nietzsche, put on the first Bestial Warlust album and get raging. All right, this is Al Naval, this is Agitators Anonymous. Um, this could be great folly. It could be the unmaking of me. Who knows? Friedrich. All right. Agitate is anonymous. Episode blah-de-blah. -blah. I'm Alan Averill. Take it easy. Metal never bends.